Okay. So um, I'll do the I'll do the intro and housekeeping, and then turn it over to you, Brian. Is that okay? That sounds great. Okay. Yeah. So welcome to another meeting of the uh, Cancer Patient Lab. Uh, this is a weekly series where we um, have uh, honored guests who lead us in a discussion today. That's Rochelle. I'll introduce her in a minute. The general housekeeping, uh, two, two things. One, uh, this is not medical advice. This is uh, for information purposes only. We try to arm people with information they can take to their medical team. And the second is uh, everything you say can and will be used against you. This is all going to be made public. So if you are concerned about it being made public, then uh, change your name, hide your video image, and don't say anything. Um, and then uh, also we are a volunteer, a patient-led all-volunteer community, and we would welcome any donations of time or money. Uh, with that, um, a quick intro to Rochelle before I turn it over to her. Um, Rochelle has a, an amazing story of her own journey with her daughter. Uh, she's um, a, a nurse by training, and she's been in the uh, patient navigation space for some time, um, helping people navigate cancer and, and applying the lessons that she derived from her experience as a caregiver to her daughter, as well as her nursing background. Um, Rochelle's based in Florida. Where in Florida, Rochelle? Miami Gardens. So I'm having train uh, rain weather right now. So I'm hoping my connection holds. Okay. All right. Well, with that, um, turn it over to you, Rochelle, and uh, Brian will moderate. Um, hi, my name is Rochelle Prosser. Um, I am the spouse and wife of two cancer survivors. My husband uh, being a two-time cancer survivor of lung and prostate cancer, and then my daughter uh, being a long-term, long-haul cancer survivor in uh, brain cancer. Um, in total, it is 15 years that I have dealt with um, direct family involvement brain, um, cancers, as well as now I am uh, navigating my father who has been diagnosed with um, metastatic stage four prostate cancer to the bone, um, the lungs, the heart, and the lymph nodes. So it is rather um, devastating news, but um, he's still around, he's still kicking. Um, as you heard, OJ Simpson recently passed away and my father is still trucking along. Um, and it it is due to certain um, medical technology advice advances that are available, but he is in a different country and is not afforded all that we are able to have here in the United States. And so navigating that, um, that minefield for um, oncology tourism is something I never thought that I would be in, but here I am today um, dealing with that. So my journey began with my husband, and at the time, they were giving tamoxifen and anthracycline for prostate cancer patients way back in 2007 and 2008. And there was this wonderful new treatment coming out with vincristine carboplatin and, cis and uh, cisplatin that actually had 100% cure rate after three doses. And so we had to make a choice very quickly after having um, a lobectomy to remove the actual cancerous portion of his tumors. Uh, of his lung cancer and and decide, do we go at it at a stem cell level or do we just say, take the win, he's had the surgery, he should survive. And um, the actual data showed that even though you did the lobectomy and had the surgery, you still had a recidivism rate of about 67 to 80% in um, African-Americans. So we chose to go ahead with the platinum-based uh, drugs. And after three doses, he was fine. Um, and that was 2008. Um, we got to the five-year mark. And in 2014, he was diagnosed with prostate cancer, which is one of the um, secondary cancers that can evolve from platinum-based cancers. The other ones are retinal disease or um, 
uh, retinal detachment in, uh, in the eye. But at the time, we didn't know that that was a possibility because no one knew what these drugs and their side effects would hold. So when I look back at his PET scan, you could see it right there. His whole bladder blew up like a glowworm. And the, it was so bright, it actually um, overshadowed his prostate. But at the time, it was also hot too. So I'm not sure if he had a single source or he already had metastatic disease um, when we treated his lung cancer. But certainly the vincristine and carboplatin certainly helped to um, delay the symptoms of his prostate cancer. And he actually had adenocarcinoma of the prostate, which was extremely aggressive. And so the only option he really had at the time um, was surgical removal because the immunotherapies that were just coming through um, actually bore out that it didn't work in the African-American population. And there just wasn't enough evidence at the time to say that that was a good uh, uh, choice to do. And, and then the radiation treatment, they already knew that it didn't work um, with African-Americans because at the time they were doing gamma knife and photon beam. And what people actually needed was a uh, proton beam um, radiation. And so that wasn't even developed at, at, in 2014. So about a month later, see, he, he didn't tell me that he had uh, prostate cancer in January of 2014. Um, but my daughter was diagnosed in March of, uh, of 2014, just after she turned four with pyelomyxoid astrocytoma of the brain. And we always wondered if that was a fallout from him, my husband receiving platinum-based uh, chemotherapy, which we now know it wasn't. It was truly just a, a, a fluke of a germ, <laughs> germ cell uh, uh, development of the brain. But we know this now. But at the time, uh, you know, I had a lot of... Um, parental guilt in saying, my husband, we took this treatment, maybe we had children too soon, maybe we did something wrong. Um, and so I lived with that a lot, knowing that my four-year-old was diagnosed with this incurable disease that was in, um, it through the optic nerve, it was in all the cellar regions of the brain, it was in the third um, ventricle of her brain, it went through um, the pons, which is the brainstem, and it went through the hind. And the <laughs> so all of the organic growth, um, very vital centers of where your brain development occurs, that's where her cancer was. And when we found it, it was 12 centimeters um, round, which is bigger than a, maybe if you put two, grapefruits together, you might get to 12 centimeters, you might, but that's about an average of the size th that I can think of. And then she also had uh, metastatic disease going down her spine. Um, she truly wasn't going to survive. Um, and I had to rely on everything that I knew in neurotrauma ICU to get her through that because acute care in cancer just really doesn't exist well whether you're in a community center or whether you're in a cancer treatment center. They just don't do that well. And that, that's one of the, my pet peeves that I really am striving today to fix is, is there's this notion, well, let's let it simmer there for 72 hours. And if they're still alive in 72 hours, then we're gonna do something. And that is just abhorrent and wrong. Um, I truly believe that just because you have a terminal illness, it does not mean your life is terminal or expendable. And we should exhaust all resources to intervene, stabilize you, because once you're stabilized, then you can re receive restorative um, treatments. So about a month after my daughter came out of the ICU, um, the doctors basically sat me down and said, we went to all of the people you told us to talk to, and they told us to listen to you. Um, you have a long-term history with some of these docs of 20 years, and basically they do everything of what you say. So I have my pen, and I I have my pen, and here are my notes, 
I, I just just tell me what to do and we'll do it. And and that's how I started my cancer journey with both of my families, my my husband and my daughter. That I was the expert in the room as, as a nurse, as Hello. the one to be the um, caregiver. Hello? Uh, sir, you're Hello? on mute. Bob, you're off mute. I'm doing okay. Bob, you're off mute. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and so um having to be that person to navigate their care knowing that there isn't any treatment available at the time of their diagnosis was really um so i actually needed mental health services but nobody asked offered it to me um they just assumed that because i was a caregiver i i didn't need to, i didn't have that struggle i didn't have those issues that regular caregivers go through in terms of finding quality and balance in the life. I was still working and practicing as a nurse at the bedside. And, and because um, my the treatments my daughter had, which were very similar to my husband, she received um, carboplatin, then Christine, and then something else called Temidar. Um, she became neutropenic very fast, which meant that I could no longer practice at the bedside and bring home anything to her. It was too risky. Um, and so I had to reinvent myself in the midst of trying to maintain healthcare, um, healthcare insurance, maintain in, um, employment and maintain um, a roof over my family's head. We had two other children at the time that were older. And so, um, conventional treatment failed my daughter very quickly. The Temidar caused her to have increased um, uh, brain swelling. And so we had to just stop the clinical trial after the first 30 days. And so we ended up at St. Jude's. That was the time when my husband told me he had prostate cancer, which was May. So he knew in January, my daughter was diagnosed in March. He told me in May, that he had adenocarcinoma of the prostate that was extremely aggressive and showed me the pathology reports and had me talk to his oncologist, um, who was quite upset at him for not doing something about it. But, um, but I understood where he was at. His family history is uh, when you go into the hospital, you may walk in, but you're coming out feet first. And that is his history of his access, his family access to healthcare. That is not our, that is not our normal now, but that's what he knew coming into the healthcare system. So we, I had to deal with his fear. I had to deal with his trepidation. I had to deal with his um, alteration in body image and machismo and being that virile husband that he's supposed to be for me. Um, we we had to talk about conversations on how how our relationship would be after this process and and come to an agreement on that that it's okay at um, at the age when I was I was thirty I was maybe thirty nine no maybe forty two I was forty two and he was fifteen years older than me and so being that young. He knew the implication it would be to me. He was worried about having a marriage after his surgery. Is he going to have a spouse that's going to be there? And I had to assure him I was his ride or die. You know, I'm not going anywhere. But those conversations don't come easy. And most often, the your your marriage is disrupted, especially if you have a child added into that to the mix of having cancer. And so I had to choose who I was going to help. Of course, I, I helped the four-year-old and off to St. Jude, Tennessee. We went from South Florida and I had to leave my husband behind, um, taking our older children with us who were 10 and 12 at the time. And it was hard. Again, I found myself in realizing that in cancer centers, even in pediatric centers, they have an outpatient model which is now called the um, hospital at home or care in place, where 
they give you treatment, you go to your um, respective room, whether it's Ronald McDonald House or the Delta Center or whatever it is that your accommodations are, and you care for your child, you cook for your child, you provide meals. However, if your child needs inpatient care or has to go again into an ICU, they literally didn't have enough staff to manage that. So when my daughter went into um, total organ failure um, during that time, and she was unresponsive, and she was just have she just had vital signs. It was really hard. I brought her in and said, "If you give me a bag of um, like you give a flight nurse, if you give me a bag of that, I can manage her IV. I can keep her pressures up. I can get her to the morning." I'd prefer her to be in the hospital, but it looks like you're not going to admit her. And they said to me, as a neurotrauma ICU nurse, we know who you are and her best chances of survival is keeping her in your care. And I said, okay, this is not, this is not happening again. And they said, no, 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 I need you to understand. We read the notes that you're a prior oncologist, he's really mad at you, but what you're doing is right. And so we're going to overlook that and rely on your experience. And so we have this bag over here that you're talking about and just tell us what orders you want and we will make sure the drugs are in the bag. We will access her before she leaves and we will put her in your care. If she is still here in the morning, we will start, we will do another plan. And I, and I sat there and I don't know about you, but I have my two older children standing right there watching this and I cannot show emotion. I cannot tell them verbally how I really feel. I have to be the parent and the caregiver and the person with the answers to my family. And so I asked for Osmolol, all these other things, and um, a few other, uh, the dibutamine and a, a dopamine, a few other things, just to make sure that I could keep her pressures, cardio, cardio and for her heart, and and um, maybe some additional pressors, just to make sure that her her blood flow to her brain would continue. Um, and then I asked for heparin just in case um, she I discovered she had a clot. Just, just some things to just keep her going until morning. What ended up happening is um, I got tired and my and my 10 year old son had to take over. The drugs made Kayla um, very volatile emotionally wise and she was trying to break out the room and try to run out. And so my two other children were like, mom, are her numbers stable? We can babysit her, but you need to sleep for an hour. You just need to sleep. I, we understand what's going on, but if we run into a problem, we will wake you up, but it's three o'clock, you need to sleep. And so um, we took turns and Kayla was running laps in the room because she was on epinephrine and all these other drugs and as a four-year-old and um, was also on dexamethasone. So if you have an idea of what dexamethasone does to a person, she is she is just not who she is and she survived and by the morning she was eating drinking downstairs causing all kinds of trouble with the with the um with the room staff and um our appointment was three o'clock in the afternoon by the time we got over to the three o'clock in the afternoon i had you know um disconnected most of her um iv fluids and uh she, but she survived and the doctor came in and he said, um, he couldn't believe it was the same child because she was talking, she was walking, she had control of her bodily function, she was fine. And he said, I don't know what you did. I'm not gonna say I don't care what you did, but I hope that you wrote down what you did because someday someone is going to come up to you and ask you, what did you do to save this child's life? And you need to say this at the rooftops because what you're doing 
is, is throwing conventional medicine on its head without surgery, um, without doing debilitating things, and she will be fine. I know, I knew that if I put her in your care, she would be fine. After that, we stayed another two months, and, um, and then we went home. So now we're in July, and uh, my husband needs surgery. And he refused to do it. He refused to do it until I got back. So now I knew I was on my way home. So now I'm calling his doctor's office to schedule the surgery. And they had pushed it all the way to September. And I said, um, how long do you normally let patients with aggressive adenocarcinoma of the prostate sit? They said, oh, we usually take it out within two weeks. I said, okay, it's been three months. And now you're pushing it out to September. Uh, I don't think he's going to be here if we wait till September. And she said, well, frankly, ma'am, she won't do it until you come home. And I said, well, I'll be home. Um, this is Thursday. I'll be home Monday morning. Can we schedule it Tuesday? She's like, no, we'll schedule it Monday. I said, no, I can't. I have to put my daughter back on chemo. She has to, I have to get there Monday to or seven o'clock to get her on her chemo. Can we do this Tuesday? It, it, her life depends on her chemo as well. And I explained to them that I was in Tennessee and she said, okay, um, we'll do it for Tuesday, six o'clock in the morning, but you have to be there. So I drove, <laughs> I drove from Tennessee uh, and got in. It took me three days to get through because my daughter was so critical. And I drove from Tennessee to Miami and um, yeah, we got there and um, she had her chemo. The doctor apologized to me um, for putting me through that. It said I was right and well, he would follow what I had to say. And the very next day I had to leave my daughter in the care of her brother and sister to give my, to have my husband have a prostatectomy. And, um, and then we came home. And so um, my daughter's journey took 10 years. It finally ended um, when we went for a second opinion to Memorial Sloan Kettering in 2018 and her VP shunt failed. On the tip of the shunt with four um, tumor cells from the inside of her tumor that they told me was dead, which it wasn't. Um, they sent it for replication. Two survived and only one had her full molecular DNA panel. Because medical terminology technology had advanced, we found um, a new gene, an FGFR gene that was never recognized before. It's a growth inhibitor. And um, they flew me off to Paris to go get this experimental drug, WO1347. I brought it back, sat and did an IRB review for humanitarian purposes to give it to my daughter. By the time we got through that, she was blind, incontinent, and uh, nonverbal again. Um, and we gave her that drug, it broke her bones. But what we found out is that she had um, cancer through every cell of her body, um, from the hair on her head to the sole of her feet and the nails on her feet. She, she literally lost the melon in her, in her skin um, because that's just how much cancer she had in her. Um, but it cured her at the molecular level but we still had that massive tumor in her head to deal with. And so that FGFR became um, the drug classifications of matinibs, which you now hear in brain cancer now, uh, selamatinib is the latest iteration. Um, so we started that and we noticed that we weren't having enough participants in there that were people of color, Hispanics, and so I worked with Memorial Sloan Kettering to bring women, bring girls in there, bring black kids in there, black girls and boys, and, and, and expand the population to now that um, particular humanitarian trial is now a um, clinical trial, uh, stage one, two. It's almost at stage three. And you heard the new um, solomatinib uh, release that actually is doing a lot of good in brain cancer now. So this is where my story ends. I'll open it up to the floor. I know it's hard to hear. Um, it's a 15 year journey. 
we have a life dates of 7 15 2014 and 8 and 4 18 of 2014 and um, i'm happy to field your questions rochelle thank you so much for that overview of your journey um so first off for anyone who wants to uh ask questions just use the raise your hand feature uh in zoom um i have a couple questions the first is um if you had the time have you thought about writing a book about your journey because it's really remarkable um as a caregiver uh as a mom and as a as a nurse so i've had um some book offers and some publishers i just don't have the i didn't have the yeah. time it'll, right. it, it'll take about nine months to, um, from soup mm -hmm. to nuts for me to do it mm -hmm. um it's just finding the time and making the time to tell the story mm -hmm. so i'm actually trialing this ai feature that um it called storily ai you may have seen some post me asking people just to try it out and it asks you key questions and then you answer it um you can either Put, voice, put it to voice or um, it can do voice to text or you can just type it in. So I'm starting to use that now as a tool to help me record the story. Mm -hmm. um, but if, for me, every time I say it, it's you here. Just no. dramatic for me. <laughs> so I have to get past the mental health aspect of it um, as the caregiver, of the as the wife, as the nurse, um, to be able to share it in a way that you can hear it without hearing the tears. Yeah. Uh, re remarkable. Um, and um, yeah, just a remarkable story. Perseverance. Incredible. Um, so it's, it's really interesting um, how you were given, you know, full authorization to provide drugs in these hospital settings where you weren't practicing. No. Tell me about that. I mean, did you have to sign, you know, waivers, liability waivers? What did that look like? Because that seems very unusual. I mean, certainly I don't think I've run across any doctors that would even entertain that. I mean, and you know, we have we have patients or citizen scientists that are pretty smart about their cancer. Um but uh, just turning over the keys of the car, <laughs> you know, um, to the to the patient um, is pretty rare. I think because of my level of understanding and what I actually was doing mm -hmm. and the, the amount of years I've had in it, by the time I met some of these doctors, you know, I'm I'm almost at 35 years in neurotrauma ICU. Right. Mm -hmm. When I was meeting them, I was coming up on 25, 20 to 25 years. So there really wasn't much that they could tell me. Also, um, I was working under um, the NFL. I, I was working with the doctors that partnered with the NFL and, and John Ro Joe Robbie for the Dolphins. And so they would come in and have devastating head injuries and so we would have to do protocols to preserve the brain to preserve the spine so the the things that i had learned to do and the skills that i had learned to do i was at such a higher level that it was higher than what the um oncologists and and those skilled in acute care would even understand like um if i could explain it today if you hear some of my podcasts i talk about um how in these brain cancers we really ought not to do surgery because it, it these tumors actually develop its own new cradle of life for these neurons and they develop um astrocytomas um astrocytes dendrites and and oligocytes that are are neuronal like but not actually perfect but the more that they move out from the center of the tumor the more normal they are so they can create new pathways within the brain and we as healthcare providers actually disrupt this by doing surgery um and so we there is a neural fold where these these brain cells are developed and in cancer patients in these young children that neuronal fold ends up turning into a tumor 
and then it's adding to this cradle of life section. So we are actually disrupting the whole um, propagation of neural cells and neural pathways. So my understanding of the brain is at such a nuanceical level that um, they quickly realized after having a conversation with me, I really was my daughter's best keeper. And um, there was no one else better than me to care for her, mm -hmm. especially in those acute hours. And I mean, because you have so much knowledge, um, I would, I'll, I'll, you know, maybe interdisciplinary knowledge. Um, uh, I think that's appropriate. Um, you know, how is, how is your, how are these best practices being codified into protocol, into protocols and um, being used on a, on a larger scale? So what I started to do, um, even while she was going through remission and, and, uh, and all of the journeys, I started working with the National Institute of Health, not by choice, just didn't happen stance. Um, COVID allowed um, the best and the brightest to come and develop tools and develop uh, assessments. And so when I looked at it from that lens and saying, okay, how can I best protect my daughter and, um, and, and still meet the confines of work, no longer being at the bedside, but still providing clinical programs that people can replicate. That's how I had to go. And so the National Institute of Health actually picked up my um, COVID outreach program because the company I was working for, we were the only ones that could actually get into post-acute centers, skilled nursing centers, because we put in place an outreach program to call the patients directly on their cell phones. So when they shut everything down and locked the doctors out, my nurses were still going strong. And so um, these are the programs that I, I, I took that from my daughter's journey in saying, okay, when there is nothing, when you're dealing with a scarcity mentality, how do you make progress in that space? And that's the lens under which I create all of my clinical programs and they're replicable in cardiology, in primary care, physician spaces, and now oncology, but really it is chronic disease management. And I bring that um, because I dealt with understanding the body plus knowing that the brain is, can be injured too. I really have an in-depth knowledge of how the body works. And, and so I bring that to any patients or physicians that I encounter. Got it. Um, I don't want to hog the floor. I have more questions, um, but um, I do want to, you know, open it up uh, to anyone else if they have questions. All right, we're going to just keep chugging along with the uh, Rochelle and Brian show here. Um, uh, so, what's interesting is that you have knowledge of, you know brain cancer and prostate cancer and, lung. and you know here at the cancer patient lab we help patients with prostate brain and pancreatic um, and what we've learned is that there can be um, knowledge shared across cancer settings that may not be very well known um, and so I think that that's a benefit to, you know, to, to what we offer. Um, I'm curious what you have learned about the similarities uh, between prostate and brain cancer, where there are sort of these aha moments about, oh, hey, I learned something in one of these settings that can be applied to another setting. I'm curious if you've run across those instances. What I learned is that um, no two cancer centers are equal and no mm -hmm. two community centers are equal. What you will receive um, in these settings are based on one, the pharmacy formulary that they have contracted to that will allow you to have access to treatments and therapeutics. The other thing is there's a municipality component to it based on your zip code on what the municipality will even pay for even when 
um, the hospital says yes or no. And that's under the 340B program, which um, has been in place in perpetuity, but it's set as a, a safety net. And so um, based on your zip code, your municipality will actually dictate what care you can receive or whether you can travel out of your, your county, your zip code or your state. I had no idea. I was literally taking my child anywhere. I felt like, uh, you know, the song, I've been everywhere, man, I've been everywhere. Like I literally was that person and that post office, but it was um, cancer for the cause, you know, cure for the cause journey. And I didn't realize that I was setting up networks and ecosystems, not just for the cancer centers, but also for the community centers to expand their treatments. Because if nobody knows what you have, if nobody knows that you have that next cure, it gets shelved. It gets shelved prematurely, or maybe we don't know the full gamut of the side effects that it could cause. And even though it's helpful to somebody else as an uh, uh, adjacent um, treatment, but if we don't put a mitigation plan in place to identify what those treatments are and what it causes in comorbidities, meaning does it give you high blood pressure? Does it give you urinary stasis? Does it give you GI upset? Those type of things, those become chronic diseases after you survive which, which is added stress in the survivorship realm and added cost to a family or an individual that has exhausted their resources. So the I had no idea. And these are the things that I learned. I also learned that there are plenty of resources out there at the government level that is just not being shared. And so I put as part of my program together to provide that to patients. If you contact me, I will give that to you because no one should have a seven figure medical bill. And if you think it was one, I was in it for 10 years, 10 years. And yeah. that was just my toddler. So um, I could have sold everything, which is what they want you to do. They want you to sell everything, liquidate your assets, liquidate mm -hmm. your 401ks and, and 403bs, uh, mm -hmm. liquidate your stocks and bonds and all of those things, but mm -hmm. you actually don't have to. Hmm. So their government, their government protections against that. Correct, correct. If you're 65 and older, they actually pay you while you have cancer. And no, it's not the death benefit. It's actually real money, and you don't have to be disabled to receive it. And it would be over and above anything over and that you above. might be receiving from an over employer or. Correct. Correct. Wow. As long as you're 65 and older. Correct. Mm, interesting. Um. I don't see any hands up. Oh, there we go. Uh, David. David, David, go ahead. I was trying to get the timing right. Um, so Rochelle, are you seeing any uh, improvement over um, emotional support for both patients and for caregivers? Is that getting any better over time? You know, I honestly thought there was no program for emotional support for caregivers and, um, and, and patients because of the big out public outcry that is happening now in in from physicians to nurses to patients there apparently there was something there it was woefully inept because they didn't understand that cancer survivorship is part and parcel and should be thought of at the beginning of treatment not at the end at the end, you've missed all of these opportunities. And so um, there is a reconstruction going on in mental health and who it should be applied to. And um, unfortunately, it's just not being done well. And so uh, I've started talking about it more often and saying, if, if the shoes were in my foot, what were the things that I could have used? And then sharing that publicly and saying, do you feel the same? There has been such an an upswell, groundswell that I'm actually having a conference in August um, to talk about oncology mindfulness because it's different than just mental health. Um, we can go to our spiritual advisors and and they can talk about mental health and prayerful and all of these things. But when somebody's terminal, you there is an actual 
uh, governing body called um, thalentology that we don't discuss. And it's not psychiatry. It is helping the deaf and dying dealing with the loss of a loved one caregiver or the loss of themselves. And it's a whole different framework than just going through Freudism egos and stuff. So, um, and most times people don't even know what to say when a loved one or their friend is diagnosed with cancer. And so um, having that proper support, there are tools, um, little game cards to help the conversation, little um, mindfulness tools to help your loved one get off the couch or just accept that, okay, they brushed their teeth. That's halfway there, you know, um, and it, 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 and some of the behaviors that you see are because of the drugs. It's not that your loved one has changed. It's the drug that is that you're dealing with and how to communicate best to communicate with that person while they're in that event. So um, it's looking at it with a different lens without blame. It's sort of uh, equating it to the smoking cessation and saying that because tobacco has nicotine and nicotine is extremely addictive, you literally cannot blame the smoker for smoking because they're an addict. And it sort of equates that to oncology. The drugs that they take actually change who that person is. The person who you met and fell in love with is not the person that's standing in front of you after a can after cancer treatment. And they may never be that same person again. And so there is things that you have to negotiate within your marriage, within your, within your parenting style, within um, just civil engagement with this individual. And least it be a child that's coming through, um, they have a sense of, lack of control on top of everything else and so how do you parent that and you're hearing the seven sides of Sybil coming out of this child so it's it's it takes a different lens it's more than just being patient it's it's actually understanding a level of understanding that this person's been through hell and they probably have ptsd and the best way to handle it is not by yelling, screaming, and 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 shame. Yeah. So I hope that hands. Well, I can I can certainly uh, uh, sympathize with a lot of that. I've been on ADT for uh, a number of years now, and have recognized uh, some changes in my own uh, emotional landscape. I am much quicker to anger. Than I ever was before. I'm also uh, quicker to tears, but anger is what I have the most trouble dealing with. And for me, the hard part is learning to deal with it, uh, not through isolation, uh, but through more other active means. But on the other hand, it, in practical terms, I am uh, a lot more careful when I get out on the road as uh, what I don't want to get into is road rage. So uh <laughs> It's it's an ongoing process. Hey, I David. I can identify with that. I can yeah. definitely identify with that. Traveling 32 hours to trying to get to New York with a dying child in the back. I practice road rage a lot, so I can totally get it. Yeah. <laughs> totally understand. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was safe space here. <laughs> I was going to say, David. You know, if you if you try uh, bipolar androgen therapy, um, you definitely don't want to get anywhere near a highway, a road. Dexamethasone, for that matter. I mean, <laughs> that's an evil drug. Um, it's very, uh, very hard on, on uh, yeah, yeah, and just uh, ration being rational. And so yeah. this is why I say that in in cancer, it it really takes a village, and it's a village of specialists, not just the oncologist that you're dealing with. You need those ancillary specialists, uh, the mental health specialists called a thalentologist. You need your community organizations. David, I would I would encourage you to go find um, I Love You Man. Um, that's an organization. You might want to find them. They're really great. Um, they're for, it's specifically for men and it's only for men. And um, uh, you might have some kinship uh, there to help you with the anger issues and self-acceptance of where you are. Um, having prostate cancer, it, 
you're just not yourself again. You know, there's a certain thing that you want to do and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And that really changes the dynamic in, in your relationships, um, whether you're married or not. And, um, you have to negotiate that. You have to talk about it. You've got to bring that person in. And sometimes their answer is no. And that, I'm sorry, I'm having a lot of lightning here. And and when that answer is no, um, that's a, that takes an emotional toll on you. You know, um, for us, we, we are now married 25 years. I wouldn't say that it was a beautiful marriage because 15 of, years of it, is de dealing with cancer and it was very difficult whether it was with him alone or with him and our daughter um, we had very differing ideas on what cancer treatment should be i think um the the most glaring moment got when the doctor came up to me with the with the paper and the pen and asking me what to write down and my husband was like he's of the value if it bothers you cut it out and i'm like you cannot cut out a person's brainstem; you will kill them um, and he, it, it just wasn't sinking in. And so I started talking and saying, okay, we're going to do an Osmonol drip and this is the rate we're going to do the dibutamine and this is the rate we're going to, we're going to put a, a brain bolt and at this diameter and put the catheter to this extent. And my husband turned to me and said, who the hell, wasn't the hell, it was an F word, who the yeah. F did I marry? And I'm like, you married a smart person, but you really need to stop talking now so I could tell this doctor the right thing. And so there is a whole dynamic that we had to come to come to Jesus with <laughs> on that. Although I'm not a doctor, the doctors respect me. But David, you have a question. I was just going to say, I've experienced it a little bit from the support side as well. When my grandmother was uh, going through uh, uh, kidney failure, uh, and she, you know, have a consult with a nephrologist or or her uh, cardiologist, and they say, "Well, how are you doing? What's new?" And she say, "Oh, I'm fine. Nothing new." And I'd look at her and I say, "Tell the doctor what's been going on. This happened. This happened. This happened." It's very hard to get a patient to overcome that reticence. And as a patient, I have experienced that myself. And I have to talk myself through. This is what I need to let the doctors know about. Um, so that sort of of uh, mental uh, support, that sort of education for patients, I think is still an existing need. It's hard to get them to do that. I think more of it is the person that's in the room while they're talking to the doctor, they don't want to hurt you. They don't want to hurt their loved one that's in that space. Or maybe they're going to talk about something um, while that individual is in the room that they did not want to share with their family member. Or maybe they're talking about the, maybe they're talking about their family member themselves, and so what I had to do was stop going in the room, and and making an agreement with the physician that if something really concerning happens, I would either contact him about my loved one, which is my husband. I'm talking about my husband here, or um, he would contact me. And I had to, in order to make my husband get out of that sphere and fear, I had to put him in the driver's seat of that. And if he forgot to talk about it, I made another appointment and had him write it down, put it in his phone, put it in his wallet, um, put it in places where he would remember to go to it and take it out. Okay, yeah, I wrote that down. Here it is. This is the questions that I had to help him become the driver of his care. I, I actually do that with my daughter right now, now that she's um, 14. I do that with her now to be the driver of her care. And if we're going to talk about sex, I leave the room because as a mom, I really shouldn't be in that conversation anyways, other than saying she needs to be on birth control or we want to have a family planning strategy. Okay. Endocrinologist take it away from there. And she can make that relationship and say, I'm comfortable with this person or I'm not comfortable talking with this person. Um, so what my husband actually shared back with me on that was, hey, can you stop calling the doctor? 
I'll let you know. <laughs> you know, you're calling the doctor and we're bringing up things that I hadn't even considered and it makes me uncomfortable. So um, eventually when you come out of your shell and are more capable of understanding what's going on with you and, and having that solidarity, you you the caregiver needs to pull back and allow that space and privacy to happen and um, understand that the caregiver should really be just that, a caregiver. I wasn't afforded that. That's the thing that I missed through this whole journey was that I should have just been a wife. I should have just been a mom. I was not afforded that opportunity. And so that construct was uh, severely disrupted with for 15 years within my marriage and within my relationship with my child who's 14 now. And I have to build that back, build back that trust. Uh, Jeffrey, I saw you laughing a few times on some of the things that I've said. Would you like to share? Yes. Um, I'm, in, <laughs> I'm in my uh, fifth year of prostate cancer. And I have uh, I've taken a lot of those journeys myself. <laughs> So when you uh, say some of those things, it kind of kindles me to re remember when I felt some of those issues. I am at a point now where I'm going to be investigating palliative care, but I have taken none of the drugs, none. I have had... Um, prostatectomy, I'm a Gleason 9, stayed uh, group 5. And when I had biorecurrence, I could not get, um, I could not get proton beam treatment in New England. Impossible. Yes. And of course, you're coming to this as a total, with total ignorance, but something's telling you that when nobody's telling you about this particular means of treatment, that's not right. So I wanted to investigate it and I did. And eventually in the middle of COVID 2022, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, self-referral, um, Dana-Farber fortunately said, well, we, we can, you can do it right here at Brigham and Women. You can do it right here at uh, Mass General. I said, no, you can't. You can't get proton beam for prostate cancer in New England. And nobody talks about it. So I ended up going to Philadelphia for almost three months to get my, um, radiation and it knocked back the PSA and uh, the doctor was wonderful. And she said, if it recurs, come back again. So I'm at that point now with a slowly rising PSA and because of comorbidity of um, coronary artery disease, the only reason I haven't been on um, hormone therapy was because as soon as they saw that report from Mass General Cardiac and said, this guy is um, borderline open heart surgery, which then happened. I had that surgery and that was a bitch to recover from. It was, you know, people told me that uh, it was wasn't that much well that's not true it was and i couldn't have um home health care people come in because we're right in the middle of covid so your local nurse um cardiac home rehab sees seven people that day and i'm going this makes no goddamn sense at all so instead of it being maybe a six month rehab it was two years and in the middle of that, I had to go to Philadelphia and 
go through the radiation. And fortunately, the radiation was targeted. So they were able to do it um, on my prostate bed, my um, iliac chain, and my the one met that had just appeared after a PSMA PET scan at Dana Farber on my sacrum. So I'm kind of like in my fifth year, I'm kind of in limbo. So when I hear about the drugs and I've seen, I have probably 25 friends either through this group or personal friends. And I've seen that they are suffering from the side effects of the interaction of the core morbidities from the drugs with, or the side effects of the drugs with their, their other diseases. I have, I learned I had osteoporosis when I, when my spine collapsed and I have five compression fractures now. And then I learned recently that I have um, interstitial lung disease that I'm going through the tests next week to find out which one. So when I'm looking at the list, I have four terminal illnesses for Christ's sakes. And so I've got to manage those. So what my wife and I've been doing is managing where we live to be to get ready for home um, hospice care, which, and, and is that going to be um, next week or is it, or am I gonna be able to survive for, who knows? But I know that uh, we've done pretty well so far but I know I'm going to be sitting there in the room with my oncologist who's going to be saying, well, now you should take Lupron. You should take this one. You should take that one. And I'm going to go, Jesus Christ, I just don't want to go in that direction. So I'm just trying to figure out how to do it. I'm not as frightened about dying. I'm, fright I'm more frightened about being totally debilitated while I am dying. Yes, I totally understand that. And um you know, oncology or care should be given in the way, manner, and preference of how the patient wants, period, and and only during that way. It, it shouldn't be forced or visited upon you. And so I, first of all, I'm sorry that you've had to go through this. It is very difficult hearing your friend's story and while you're going through this. And I, coming from the standpoint of totally understanding what you're going through after living it myself i understand the journey um we can certainly have a conversation after this offline i'm, I'm happy to assist you in that but for the but for yourself right now and for the rest of the group if you can travel to where you trust your provider if you can, go ahead and do that because clearly you trust this person in Philadelphia more than what you have here. And in Philadelphia, you will actually have more services than where you are right now. So I live happening. in West, I live in, I live in Western Massachusetts. Yeah. And my my regional hospital in West Massachusetts was purchased by um, Mass General Hospital, which is the largest health chain in Massachusetts. In fact, it's the largest employer in Massachusetts. So in that, I'm fortunate because all of my doctors that I see for heart, for osteoporosis, for, um, for everything are affiliated there. But I also know that there's certain basic restrictions on that. And Dana-Farber sits out there by itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so I moved because of the radiology. I basically, after having the prostatectomy, when my doctor told me, no, you have, we don't do uh, that kind of, um, you know, radiation. I moved to Dana Farber, and I was fortunate. I did some research and selected a good medical oncologist. But um, they have their limitations too, you know. And uh, so I, I'm trying to realize that they have to work within the standard of care because of the liability issues with it. And uh, so this group has done some wonderful things for guys with um, bipolar antigen therapy, with um, uh, using estrogen instead, instead of 
some of the ADT drugs, which then allow you to rebuild your bone mineral density, but they're hard to obtain. They're really hard to obtain uh, because as soon as you bring it up in that 20 minute window or 30 minute window, you've got with your medical oncologist say, no, we don't do that. So you go, okay, okay. I don't wanna lose these caregivers but I also don't want to be told, well, since we don't do that, this is what we've got to offer you. We don't have A, B, and C. We have D, C, and F, you know. So yeah. that's where I'm I just want to tell you, you're not alone in your struggles, mm -hmm. but you're also not alone in finding the pathway to caregiving and care delivery in the way that you want it. Um, I know that it's running low on time, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time on the call. But um, you're welcome to um, reach out to Brad or Brian and 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 connect with me so I can assist okay. you a little bit further. I just want to tell you, you're not alone. Okay, you're not alone. Thank you. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Um, Brian, 